because Putin specifically rules through the intelligence services, which is a combination of uh, rule of terror and rule of infiltration, it's probably pretty stable. It's just that it's pretty brittle. So the Russian government, Putin specifically, is not vulnerable until the day that they are. Um, looking back along the stretch of history, if you look at the year before every coup or revolution, there was no reason to think anything was wrong. It all boils up very quickly, but you have to have a mass trigger. So, for example, the loss in the Crimea War damaged the Tsars. The loss in the October Revolution triggered the withdrawal from World War I and the collapse of the Tsarist system. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis led to the fall of Khrushchev. You have to have that very short, sharp, painful realization that Russia has lost and lost big, and then the underlying population that has been buying into the propaganda realizes it's all wrong, and then the government turns. We're not there yet. I don't think the fall of Crimea even would be enough to do that. But that is really the only thing that's on the short-term horizon that would even maybe fall into that cat feet. So, for example, if the Ukrainians were able to not simply um, cut that rail line, those rail lines going into Crimea, but actually advance to the coast so that Crimea becomes basically a death camp run by Russians where Russians are dying and starving. Because remember, the Russians destroyed the Kakova Dam. There's no more irrigation for agriculture in Crimea at all, so all the food is imported. If you turn that into a very public, globally aware place where the Russians are dying in the streets because they can't get food in, maybe. Uh, I, I can't comment about Avadika or, or Bakhmut. Those, those numbers are just too squirrely. I, I don't want to say that they're wrong. I think they're in the right realm. As for the half a million number, I think that's absolutely accurate. Um, keep in mind, the Russians had 8 million men in their 20s, or at least that's what they started the war with. If they've lost a half a million now, and a million have fled, that still leaves them with 6.5 million bodies to throw at this problem. And to be perfectly blunt, the Russians have yet to fully mobilize. Most of the people that they've brought in through their draft system have been minorities from ethnically disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged areas. They haven't really gotten into the core of what the country is capable of. That's still ahead of us. But at this rate, there's no way the Russians can keep this up for another eight years. And I know that sounds like a long time. It is. But remember two things. Number one, the Russians never fight short wars. They do short intimidations. Their wars are always long because they're always about human waves. Number two, if they do this, this is their last war because there aren't enough Russians under age 20 to theoretically repopulate the system. So when this is done one way or another, Russia is done. If the Ukrainians can achieve, even just for brief moments, local air superiority, then the capacities of the Iranian military, excuse me, the capacities of the Ukrainian military to launch um, offensive changes. Every offensive that the Ukrainians have attempted for the last 12 months has bogged down because they don't have air superiority. And if they can't maneuver functionally with armor and, um, and armored vehicles, then they can't move nearly as quickly. They can't move in large number. And it makes it a lot easier for Russian artillery to pick them apart. Well, if you can achieve even just for a few hours a certain blanket, then the tables turn and the Ukrainians can do things like clear mines uh, without having to get shot at from artillery. And uh, you throw a Patriot into that, you throw the new F-16s into that, you combine that with a little bit more liberal restrictions on the Ukrainians' ability to tar target objects within Russia proper, and you're seeing the Ukrainians already starting to use things like the ATCAMs to prep, say, Crimea, uh, by basically taking out something like an S... For an S-400 air defense system a day for the last week. Uh, and the Russians only have 50 of those for their entire country. So we're changing the shape of the battlefield very quickly. You plug a Patriot into that process and we can actually have perhaps a meaningful counteroffensive this summer. Well, the, the S-400s have always been a bit of a mystery from the American and the NATO point of view, because until you're in a hot war, you have no idea how well the top-of-the-line equipment is going to work. Well, the S-400 is supposedly pre-war. The most sophisticated anti-missile and anti-aircraft weapon system on the planet. Much better, supposedly, than what the Americans could do. And now we discover it 
can't deal with rockets. So not only is this talking the Russian down several peaks in terms of their own feeling of their inventability. Not only is it reducing the interest of countries like India and getting any weapon system from the Russians, because now they realize they are not all that it's changing the complex zone of what is possible. Because if you can basically in one spot blade the entire Russian air defense grid, then you are not just talking about a sense in the Ukraine war, you are talking about a sense in what Russia is capable of and we are still kind of coming to grips with that. What that means, this is also new. That is definitely the goal. Even if you don't conquer, reconquer, re-liberate, whatever word you want to use, Crimea. Its, its military supply basically goes on two routes. There's a railroad that is on the mainland that goes through Maripol, which is somewhat vulnerable to Ukraine assault today. And that's the new line. That's the backup line. And then you have got the primary line, which is the car straight base, which is becoming increasingly vulnerable. And I would argue that if the Ukrainians wanted to take the out today, they could. But they are waiting for more military capacity. And when you do that, Crimea goes from being a launch threat from Russian assault to simply the most vulnerable part of the Russian landmass. And that's a different sort of complex. So this summer is going to get really interesting. Will the Ukrainians be able to put this off? Don't know. Every, everyone like me. Oh, so this were coming. We all made prediction about how this was going to go. And we are all wrong. And then we caught new data. And we reassessed. And we are all wrong again. I am just trying to highlight where we are seeing things move and where that might take us. The winter is going to be awful. It doesn't matter really what happens at this point. It's just a question of how much force does it get. The Russians have basically taken something called the Fab 1500, dusted off it off from the Cold War stories, put a Chinese made flight kit on it, and have glide bombed it in and simply destroyed entire power plant. The Fab 1500 has roughly a metric ton of explosives in it, and it has a blast radius in excess of three quarters of a kilometer. So you are not talking about sending an Iranian drone into a small transformer station. Some of them can be repaired in a few hours. We are talking about leaving a crater in the ground where a power generation asset used to be. And that's basically the entirety of southern and eastern Ukraine now. So there simply is not enough for the only way that communities that are kind of east of Kiev and southeast of Kiev are going to have electricity this summer is if it's imported from the European Union. So it's a question now of transmission, now likely. Transmission is safer to put off the new generation. But yes, it's going to be a cold winter for all concerned. Okay, thank you for watching the Oblitics research.